Hi, my name is Bob Notmar. I'm going to be speaking about extracting character networks from narrative text this afternoon. I'm going to be talking about uh, extracting character networks from narrative text. So why, why this project? Uh, I've always been interested in networks, uh, not only for their structure, but also the information that you can uh, organize in a network. Um, and also, networks are often used to model flow of all different kinds of things, uh, molecules, data, water, information, things like that. So they're a very powerful uh, data structure. Uh, there have been some recent uh, investigations of old problems using network analysis. Uh, these are two examples that are in the Wolfram Data Repository. One is the uh, Paul Revere Social Network of the, uh, in Colonial Boston that modeled the uh, membership of various patriots in different lodges, as they were called. The red nodes are the lodges, and the gray nodes are the individual uh, colonists. And the question was whether or not Paul Revere uh, was central to uh, the revolutionary effort. And using graph measures, they were able to show that he was very central in the network. He had a very high centrality and things like that. He's a member of five of the six lodges uh, that were modeled here. Uh, there's also another patriot that's identified um, as uh, an important contributor as well with a different uh, mathematical technique, uh, not, not based on the, the graph structure itself. Last uh, spring, there was a nice publication about the Irish Viking network, and I worked with the authors to get their data into the repository. And uh, the, it was about the Battle of Clontarf that was fought in Ireland uh, almost a thousand years, actually a little over a thousand years ago. The early scholarship uh, on the battle said that it, it was the Vikings, or excuse me, the Irish evicting the Vikings from Ireland. And then 50, 100 years ago, the scholarship switched, and the story was that it was, the Vikings were having inter clan uh, conflict. The uh, Vikings got involved with that and eventually got kicked out. Um, and then these authors took the, uh, an almost contemporary description of the battle. It was written 100, 200 years after the battle. But they pulled out all the individual characters involved in the battle, including uh, Brian Baru. You may have heard of him as, as an Irish um, hero. And uh, all of the interactions, who spoke to whom, was it friendly, was it hostile, who fought whom, and so on, and they built this network from it and doing network analysis on it. While there was a fair amount of Irish-Irish conflict, the majority of the conflict was Irish-Viking by a number of different measures. And um, this is showing the whole network here. Uh, the blue are the Vikings, the green are the Irish. If you look at the friendly interactions, you can see that it's mostly green and green and blue and blue. And if you look at the negative interactions, um, it's mostly uh, green and blue that are connected. There are some green and green connected, so there was inter-clan conflict. Um, uh, but it wasn't exclusively inter-clan conflict. So I thought, you know, after I did this work with them, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I could take a collection of books that I've read um, and analyze the character networks in them? And so what I wanted to do was build the character networks and see if they changed over time, if one network stood out against the others, and perhaps why, um, and uh, how do the different roles of the different groups of the characters, the police, the perpetrators, uh, the victims, uh, and uh, civilians, the bystanders that are involved, you know, how do they contribute to the structure of the network and, and uh, things like that. There were two main characters throughout most of the books, Jim, uh, Joel Heaporn and Jim Chi, and, you know, is their relationship always the same? It was Lieutenant Leaporn and Sergeant Chi, you know, uh, was one by rank always more important than the other or not? Uh, you know, what could the network structure reveal about that? And then finally, um, 
his daughter, Anne Hillerman, has written four more books in the series. Uh, Tony Hillerman himself passed away a few years ago, so he's no longer writing. And I've read one of her, I read her first book, and it's definitely different. I mean, it's still a murder mystery. It's still Jolie Porn and Jim Chi involved. It's still set in New Mexico and Arizona. But there's a difference in her prose, and there's a difference in her, her uh, dialogue. And so, you know, is there a way we can quantify that with uh, textual analysis? So these were my ambitions uh, last May when I first started on this. So I, I sat down and took the first book, um, and on a Saturday and a Sunday afternoon, I, I basically was able to skim through it again and tabulate all of the characters that had interactions. Either they spoke to each other, they wrote to each other in a letter. Uh, there was a description of, of one character, uh, some, somebody describing an interaction between two other characters or something like that. And from that, I could easily manually create a network. So we had uh, 70 characters that I had identified. Uh, a little a bit of uh, coding here to standardize the names, uh, pull all the uh, characters out of the first two columns of the table to create the edges. And we have 77 edges in the table, uh, 70 characters, and we can make the manual network, the default layout, and with a little bit of extra coding, which is in the initialization section at the end of the notebook, we can make a nice layout here where I've uh, labeled the victim. Uh, actually, the, uh, the police here are in blue. Here's Joe Lee Porn, seems fairly central. Um, here's uh, one of the victim, the first victim that got the whole thing started. Somebody else was killed along the way, and then the three red nodes are the, the bad guys, and everybody else is a civilian. So, at this point, reality struck. Um, I was capturing extra interactions, not just who spoke to whom uh, or who was physically at the same place at the same time as another character. Um, and uh, I was capturing additional information such as clan membership and stuff like that. If I was a real sociologist, yeah, I mean, that would be the real meat of what I was after. Um, but it could be a distraction for what I was trying to do. And if I wanted to do all 20 books, I'd need an army of graduate students to do it the way I was doing it. So we need to get the books in electronic form. So if you're interested in doing this sort of work, uh, there's something called Project Gutenberg. They've got nearly 60,000 books in electronic form that are free to download, to read, to analyze, and things like that. Uh, there are some books in the same genre. A couple of stories by Agatha Christie are in there. These are murder mysteries. Uh, there's another one in there called The Legends of King Arthur and His Knights. It's been used by people to do character identification. Uh, this one I looked at also. It's a little bit easy to pick the characters out because they're Lord this and Madam that. and So you just look for these titles and honorifics, and it's real easy to pull out who's who. Um, in my case, uh, what I had to do was buy the books from Kindle and put them on my laptop, and fortunately, you can find where the file is. That's not always the case. Uh, other vendors uh, kind of hide where the files are. Um, and then there's an app uh, that you can get from EPUBsoft eBook Converter, which will convert it from the various different eBook formats into plain text, and that's what I did. So I got three books, for starters. Uh, the first one is The Blessing Way, which is the one that I'm going to talk about today. The other two are waiting in the wings to be processed. Um, I did, so there, there's a number of, uh, a couple of uh, pieces of prior art out there using uh, Wolfram language to analyze text. And uh, what I wanted to do then was identify um, the spoken text and then by association the speaker, uh, because they should be nearby in the body of the text, and then identify the interactions, again, by proximity. If two people are speaking to each other, they should be in adjoining paragraphs or almost adjoining paragraphs. Um, early workers in this area used the same chapter 
the two characters appeared in the same chapter, they drew an edge between them in the networks. And, and that's the Donald uh, Knuth network for Les Miserables, which is available as uh, example data in Wolfram language. I wanted to know if we could do better uh, by looking at sentence or paragraph structure than just using you know, chapter uh, membership as, as a criterion. And when we're all done, we sit back and get to actually realize how easily our own brains do all of this and how we have to struggle to do it computationally. So this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, these are the two, uh, well, okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, uh, this website here um, uh, analyzed text and um, it was just really word frequencies and things like that. And then uh, John McClune um, did something a little more interesting. They followed character uh, frequency over the course of, of the book, uh, Lord of the Flies, and then uh, also analyzed the semantics of the text to see how it changed over time from being positive to negative. Okay. So what I based my work on was using text sentences and text structure. Text sentences will take text and break it up into individual sentences. It uses a neural network in the background to do that. Text structure does the same thing, except it can give you parts of speech, for example. So taking the first part of Alice in Wonderland, we can take the sentences out with text sentences, takes a bit to load it. So here we are, here are the sentences all broken out. And then for each sentence, we can uh, take text structure of that and using it without any uh, second argument, it will give you the whole sentence at the lowest level, actually shown at the top here, are the parts of speech and then you can combine, uh, let's say an adverb and an adjective, you get an adjectival phrase and so on, noun phrases, and build yourself all the way up to a sentence in the end. Or we can get the parts of speech directly uh, just by asking for that, and this is what I did here. I wanted to tag the individual words and then use that grammatical structure as patterns to identify quoted text, assuming it would be spoken text, and then finding pronouns and nouns and proper nouns nearby, uh, along with a verb, for example, Bill said, uh, to identify the speaker for that text. So that was my strategy. So, okay, so this is the, the workflow and I'm not going to get through all of this in detail uh, in the time that we have. So I, I'll probably skip over some stuff. Um, so a number of things, you know, is the text well structured? Are there typographical conventions? Are they, are they used consistently? Uh, different books are rendered in free text in different ways. The books that I used here used curly quotes, for example, uh, so it was very easy to find the beginning and the end of a quotation. Other times you'll find straight quotes, and that's a little harder than to, you have to write, be more careful in the patterns that you write to pick out the beginning and the end of text. Uh, chapters and paragraphs, how are they uh, separated and delimited? Um, in this case, every paragraph uh, was separated from the next one by two new line characters, so that was very easy to do. Uh, are there special characters? Um, if you have foreign text in your book, in your, in your corpus that you're working with, and this one did, it had Navajo text, but here they did not italicize it. Uh, in the printed book it was italicized, but in the ebook version, or in the plain text, it was not. Um, in Agatha Christie's book that I looked at, the French that showed up there had, uh, it was italics in the regular text, but in the plain text, it had a leading underscore and a following underscore to indicate that it was underlined um, and therefore italicized. And that, those underscores made trouble for uh, text sentences and text structure. So you've got to do some data cleaning. Um, it's always needed. Uh, we also found cases where uh, a, a space was missing after a period at the end of a sentence. So two sentences were glued together. Um, and we needed to fix things like that. We needed to come up with an overall 
good design for the data so that we could work with it easily. So a good data structure uh, design is always needed. Um, I was going to, I tried to go through and use part of speech tagging to identify characters. And while proper nouns will identify characters, they also identify places. So that doesn't help. Uh, so that was a dead end. Uh, I thought I could go through and go through the text and select, you know, ah, here's a proper noun, you know, somebody's name, I can pull it out. That turned out to be a rabbit hole. It was just way, way, way too slow. Um, so if I, well, somebody was going to pursue that method, they would need some tools to make that a lot easier. Uh, what I ended up doing was using uh, the text element patterns and string patterns to identify quoted text and then by adjacency, the speakers. Um, so, you know, so that's how I got the speaker attribution. Uh, one thing that's still a problem is prono, uh, uh, pronoun resolution. Um, he and she and it, uh, trying to find out to whom they refer. That is uh, a serious research topic. A lot of people are working on that. They're using neural nets for it. Um, I haven't gotten that far yet to work on that, to, make, to get around that problem. And then finally, um, put, it, put together a network. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're dealing with, uh, we can import the book, uh, 30,000 characters. We can take a look at the beginning of it uh, with this helper function called find view. Uh, and it just shows the beginning of the text here, the, uh, the author, the title, uh, a table of contents, uh, there's a, and then it begins with the first chapter here. Chapters, it turned out, were identified this way, so I can look for this pattern, greater than sign, space, digit characters, space, less than sign. We also see that the, uh, it turns out that all the chapters, the first three words are capitalized, so this is something we're going to have to clean up also. Looking at the end of the book, okay, so here's the end of the first chapter, and it ends, ah, here's acknowledgement, so that we're at the end, but there's a whole bunch of after matter that needs to be removed. Okay. So, um, this uh, pattern here, uh, looking for the chapters, is what I just mentioned, and acknowledgement at the end. We can split everything up. There was also, it turns out, an acknowledgement section in the front matter. Uh, so we can actually start pulling out our chapters beginning with this snippet of string. So we pull out the chapter positions and uh, we can split them and then get the start and end positions and then pull all the chapters out. And so we've got 18 chapters in the book and the way I've set this up, I pull out the title. Some books have you know, a brief phrase as the title. This book did not. And so if, depending on the work you're doing, that may or may not be of interest for you. And then we have the body of the chapter as one big string. Here are the string counts. The shortest chapter is 7,000 characters. The longest one is over 45,000. And here's what they look like. So there's a you know, the longer chapters are back here, and this is where a lot of the action is actually in the novel itself. Uh, special characters need to be at least examined, if not modified. Um, they don't, did not present a problem here, so I will just skip over that. Um, so let's pull all the chapter bodies out to work with. So some of the data cleaning we had to do was convert the first three capitalized words into uh, mixed case text as appropriate. I couldn't do it as a simple rule because here's a proper noun at the very beginning um, that I didn't have anything to identify directly, so it was just easier to write very specific rules to do that data cleaning. And uh, there were a, a couple of places where um, there were some new lines that weren't delimiting things that were quite the right way. Uh, there are songs and quotations in the book, Indian chants and things like that. Somebody was quoting Othello later on in the book. And those were inside of single curly quotes, inside of double curly, curly quotes. And I wanted to keep those things together 
um, but I still wanted to be able to preserve the, uh, the, the particular layout where each, um, uh, not phrase, not quite a stanza either, is on its own separate line. So I kept those separated by a single new line and paragraphs by pairs of new lines. So that's what that takes care of. Um, there was also a problem where uh, there was a, a sentence that wasn't broken properly, and so we fixed that here. And um, yeah, there was also a problem where after the, the spoken parts from Othello, there was a, a closing curly quote, but after it was an opening double quote. So somehow uh, the text translation got messed up, but it was very easy to fix. It was a very regular pattern. So we could fix that and get all of them taken care of. Um, and then we took care of the new lines in the quotations. Uh, we'd already done that for the, the songs and the chants. And uh, missing spaces between a couple of words that I spotted as I was reading through the text. I probably didn't catch all of them. And then uh, I put the process chapters back into the body of, um, into the chapter bodies. Notice that I didn't edit the book text directly. I did everything algorithmically. Um, I find that's a better way to clean up text if you need to go back and, and fix something. You didn't do it quite right the first time. It's much easier to fix a little bit of code than go back and scan through a whole big chunk of text and re-edit it by hand. Okay. Um, let me just quickly go through this. I structured the text, um, breaking it up into paragraphs. So here's the first paragraph. And then those were broken up into sentences. Here are the sentences from it. And then I broke those up into parts of speech. So here are the parts of speech for each of those sentences. And um, here's another example here. This was an, a chant. And uh, that's, those are the parts of speech for it. The parts of speech, all of these guys here, are actually text elements. And uh, it's a very rich data structure. I, I won't go into the details here. And then I put everything together into a book. I won't run this because it takes 10 to 13 minutes. But it processes each chapter. And we end up then with a title, uh, the body text that we had before, a ragged array of sentences. Uh, the first level are for the paragraphs, the second level are for the individual sentences, and then for the text structure, which are the uh, grammatical parts of speech, again, a, a ragged array data structure. Uh, one, the first level for the paragraphs, the second level for the, for the sentences. These two data structures are parallel, so whatever I do in this one or, or find in this one, I can locate in this one as well. Um, and then I exported everything to a file so it would be easy to pick up and use again, which I'm doing right here. Okay. Um, the speech pattern in plain text is fairly easy. Open curly quote, a long stretch of text without a closing curly quote, and then a closing curly quote. This works great on plain text, even for quotations that span paragraphs by the same speaker. Um, let's see. Let's just jump right through all of these here. Uh, again, the um, number of uh, quotes in the different chapters. Here's an example of, of the quote that was identified. And then here I pull out all the speech positions in the different chapters. So in the first chapter, as soon as this gets done, uh, there were six pieces of quoted text uh, in the second paragraph, the fourth paragraph, the sixth paragraph spanning into the seventh, the eleventh, and the twenty-sixth. And just to pluck one out, let's see. Um, yeah, so um, if they, uh, there were some cases where I had them uh, in the same paragraph, but there was 
there were sentences in between. Uh, if the spoken text is in the same paragraph, it's the same speaker, so those could be combined. Um, and so we had 100, eight, 801 pieces of quoted text, and here's an example here. And this little, intera little interactive lets me go from chapter to chapter, and, and within the chapters, one spoken uh, piece of text to the next. Okay, what I wanted to do next then, um, this one, in this one here, you know, is that we've got some narrative text in the middle, and it actually includes the speaker's name, and this is what we're going to be able to use to build our network. So this is my divide and conquer strategy, is to uh, separate out the different kinds of text that we have, those that are narrative free and those that have narrative text in them. Here's a narrative free one. And this is a function that does, uh, identifies the patterns for us and removes the, uh, the text that's spoken so that we're left with just the uh, residual narrative text. So there are 329 uh, pieces of, of, of uh, quoted text that did not have um, uh, narrative text in it. Uh, there's, here's an example of what they look like. And then the uh, ones with narrative text we just get by complement. Uh, there are 472 of those and here's what they look like. Then we identified the speakers, and this is where we made use of the uh, parts of speech. Again, we used patterns to get rid of the uh, quoted text. So here's a sentence with the uh, quotes in it, and then we can remove the quoted text, and we're just left with the speaker's name and the verb and punctuation. And this is what we worked on then. And most of them were fairly short, which was good. And so let's just pull some out here. Here's an example um, of what a text element looks like. And what we're focusing on here is the entity that tells us what the, what the uh, part of speech is. Okay. This is the list of rules that we use, the list of patterns that we use to uh, identify the parts of speech that we needed to identify the speakers. And then I used a set of replacement rules after that to actually you know, take a pronoun followed by adverb, followed by verb, and then just use the, the pronoun as the speaker. So we did that. And then here are the list of all the speakers that we got. There were a couple that looked like they might be problematic. Um, it and there. And let's see. Let me pull them out. And it turns out the it is okay because it's re actually referring to somebody who was in costume. So we didn't know the identity or the author didn't want us to know the identity right away. The other two here there is quoted text that was used to emphasize something. So that's why um, uh, it was picked up. So we can get rid of these two here, again, programmatically, and have our clean list of speakers. This list of rules was made by hand uh, to take the uh, text elements and give us a plain string of the character's name. Uh, this I got because I, I read the book, I knew who the full character's name was. So this is something that one would have to do uh, by hand. We can get the vertices out. Here's my simple rule that says that two people had contact if they were in the same chapter and within uh, D paragraphs of each other, the default being two. So I construct my edges. Here's the first edge. I make the network and then I can compare my original network to the automated network. And they're not the same. We don't expect them to be the same, but there are some similarities. Uh, here's Joe Leaphorn here, fairly central. Here he is here, fairly central as well. So this is as far as I've gotten. It's a work in progress. Uh, there's a lot more we can try. 
um, uh, pronoun resolution, co-referent resolution. Uh, I can explore dependency strings. Text structure uh, does give us what's called a dependency string. I just discovered this over the weekend, so I've got to figure out more what we can do with it. What I like about it is it looks like we've got subject and object out of sentences, so I can use that to help identify who's actually speaking as opposed to being spoken about. Um, there are more books in the series to look at, and I think machine learning is probably going to have to be used to make this a feasible enterprise. And thank you for your attention and being patient enough to let me run over. I'll take two questions.